I wish to argue that all human beings are innately, universally, necessarily a priori lonely. The loneliness is the basis of human existence. It's a favorite existential theme, so it, that's nothing new. The problem is uh, why this is so. I'm going to try to respond to that. And the consequences of loneliness, that's the third thing. And what can be done about it, namely its remedies. So those are the four things I wish to address. The twin principles I propose to defend are that all we feel, think, say, and do occurs between two emotional and cognitive poles in human consciousness, between the solipsistic insularity of loneliness and the intentional desire to transcend it by attaining intimate attachments. The two terminals of consciousness constitute the dynamics of repulsion and attraction, which continually guide us through our passions, thoughts, and actions. After the biological drives for air, water, nourishment, and sleep, and before sex, that's a dig at Freudian psychoanalysis, are met, the most insistent psychological need and motivational drive in human beings is to secure an intimate relation to other self-conscious creatures, whether animal, human, or divine. In effect, I wish to replace Freud's principle of libidinal, libidinal energy with the anxiety of isolation. The proof that the fear of loneliness is innate can be demonstrated by citing the works of Margaret Ribble, Donald Winnicott, John Bowlby, Renee Spitz, Anna Freud, Dorothy Burlingham, Margaret Mahler, and Harry Harlow's experiments with young monkeys who show, collectively, who show that without sufficient emotional nurturance, infants retreat back toward the womb and even death. Over a year, uh, over half of the deaths of institutionalized children under the age of one year in England during the First World War uh, died. Uh, uh, it was originally called Marasmus Hospitalism Anaclectic Depression by Rene Spitz, so on and so forth. Uh, before I go on, I'd like to cite a, a case that occurred in 2005 in Tampa Bay, Florida. Uh, you can access it on Google. Um, one day, a social worker was uh, walking by and noticed a child. Uh, she lived in the neighborhood. She was a neighbor. Uh, and uh, the child was staring out a broken uh, window and had this very vacant look in her eyes. Uh, she looked very emaciated. And uh, then uh, she, the child disappeared. And the social worker reported it to Child Protective Services in Tampa Bay. Shortly thereafter, the police came by. And essentially what they found, and it's described in the literature and the news reports, was what uh, consisted basically of a feral child. She wasn't autistic. Uh, there was nothing wrong with her in terms of her intellect. But she didn't respond to people. Uh, she lived in a room in the house all by herself. She was wearing diapers. She couldn't talk. Uh, she was covered with sores. Her diapers were full, and uh, she didn't seem to react to human, to human contact. So it's in the Tampa Bay Times. It's worth taking a look at because it shows you the severity of a situation like this. Now, when children are neglected, and I've been a social worker and a therapist for 30 years, when children are neglected and not nurtured, there can be a very serious consequences to it. Uh, in 2015, this year, uh, the child was revisited. Actually, Oprah Winfrey, um, the child was adopted after two years uh, by a caring couple. and. Uh, but she's never managed to talk. She seems to stay away from people. Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey got the parents to uh, get on her show under contract so that no one else can discuss the case with the parents. She does go to school. Obviously, she'd be in a special eds class or something like that. But uh, she has, her development has been very, very uh, primitive. Uh, she seems to get along a little better with the father, the adoptive father, uh, probably because the mother was so negligent in her relationships. So you get the picture of someone who was uh, 
basically just physically cared for without any emotional contact or, or uh, you know, uh, sustenance or uh, nurturance or anything of the sort. And I'm going to come back to this in a while, but anyway, I want you to hold that picture in mind. The other thing that's interesting is in terms of the children that died in the, Anna Freud and Dorothy Burlingham uh, did a lot of work on, on this sort of thing. But the interesting thing is, if half of the children died before the age of one, was it the children who had been nurtured by their mothers, say for six or eight months or whatever it might be, and then placed in the hospitals or institutions, or was it the newborns that were removed immediately? And I don't know the answer to that, but I think the answer would be significant in terms of child development, loneliness, and overcoming loneliness, that sort of thing. The second argument I wish to propose to you is that no human being would ever wish to be immortal at the price of being the only self-conscious creature in a lifeless universe, condemned to exist eternally alone in the infinite expanses of space and time. Okay. Now you can consider that uh, whether you yourself would wish to be, as I say, the only living creature uh, independent of God and independent of man, would it be worth being immortal at that price? <clears throat> in the book of Proverbs, it is said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To be estranged from God is the ultimate terror. Consider St. Augustine's prayer to the Lord. And I'm quoting Augustine now in the Confessions. Who will give me help so that I may rest in you? Who will give me help so that I may forget my evils and embrace you, my one good? Have pity on me so that I may speak. What am I myself to you that you command me to love you? You command me to love you and grow angry and threaten me with mighty woes unless I do. The ultimate woe, of course, would be absolute eternal loneliness, estrangement from God. Estrangement's actually a Galian term. It's used by Hegel. And Kierkegaard picks up on it, uh, the existentialist. Anyway, beyond that, Kant, Immanuel Kant, who writes the Critique of Pure Reason, tells the story of a miserly man whose complete disdain and contempt for his fellow man earns him a visit from the angel of death, who tells him he is condemned to be transported and dwell eternally in the farthest and darkest reaches of the universe, alone forever, without human or divine contact. It's a passage in Kant where, oddly enough, Kant quotes, it's called Karazan's uh, Dream or Karazan's uh, Nightmare. And he's quoting a magazine. It's very unusual for Kant to quote uh, specific philosophers, let alone entertain long passages. But this, this goes on for a full two pages. So it's interesting. Kant himself was uh, incredibly religious. He was a pietist and that sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, it would be like being buried alive, even though the universe, the entire universe, is your tomb. I had a patient, uh, actually, at uh, my clinic in uh, Los Angeles County, where his wife would bring him in. He'd come into the room, and he would crawl into a corner, I mean, literally crawl, and he'd hu hu huddle up within himself, and he would describe his anxiety states as uh, being entombed. Uh, as being buried alive. Uh, some of you are familiar with uh, the Antigone of so Sophocles. You might remember that she was condemned to be uh, entombed alive and she decided she'd rather commit suicide. In Kierkegaard, uh, Abraham's fear of estrangement is related to God's command to sacrifice Isaac. Through a leap of paradoxical faith, I, uh, Abraham believes both that Isaac will be sacrificed and he will be saved. He makes a religious choice to go ahead and climb Mount Moriah and sacrifice his son. Now this is beyond understanding. It, it defies comprehension. Uh, this is uh, in fear and trembling. We can compare, however, uh, and contrast Abraham with Agamemnon's sacrifice of Iphigenia so that the Greek fleet can uh, sail to Troy. There we understand the sacrifice. It's, it's done for a purpose, namely to salvage the Greek expedition. But in the case of uh, 
Abraham, it's beyond comprehension, it's beyond language. It's, it's to believe a contradiction, just as if you would believe that Christ is both God and man. It takes that kind of superhuman uh, faith, and that's Kierkegaard's point. My point, however, is that we're lonely from the cradle to the grave and perhaps beyond. This is from uh, Joseph Conrad's An Outcast of the Islands, and I, I, I believe that. Whether we're separated from mankind, or whether we're separated from a loved one, or whether we're separated from uh, God, it creates a, a feeling of, of terrible loneliness. In the cases I've just cited, obviously, it's some sort of cosmic loneliness. Loneliness intrinsically means a sense of separation. The opposite of separation is intimacy, belonging, or togetherness. So I'm playing off, and this is important, uh, I believe human beings are intrinsically, innately lonely, but I think there is some sort of solution for it, and I'm, I'm going to propose the solutions if I can uh, get that far. Basically, there are five sources of human separation. First, there is the fetus's biological ejection from the womb. I call that object-to-object -object separation, and it's Freud's initial state of anxiety. When a child is first born and begins to develop a consciousness, uh, Freud says it initially experiences what he calls a, an oceanic feeling of undifferentiated one, oneness. In other words, it doesn't distinguish colors from sounds, objects from itself, or anything like that. It's like a cacophony of sounds and a, and a kaleidoscope of colors without any distinctions within it. So it's basically a feeling. That's where the child starts. That's where we start as, as uh, human beings. William James says the same, gives the same description as a differentless uh, unity in uh, the Principles of Psychology, in the first uh, volume of the Principles of Psychology. And uh, Hegel, the famous idealist philosopher, does the same in an opening passage in the Phenomenology, Phenomenology of Spirit called uh, Sense Certainty. So these three uh, philosophers and psychologists uh, agree that the first stage in human development or existence is this sort of oceanic feeling that has no distinctions, no cognitive distinctions. Second stage, the conscious, uh, and, uh, uh, the conscious subject emotionally and cognitively separates from the external world. In other words, in order to be self-conscious, you have to be conscious of something that is not the self. So self and object mutually condition each other. Kant says this in the Critique of Pure Reason. That's his argument in behalf of self-consciousness. The transcendental unity of apperception is actually constituted by, conditioned by, the transcendental object equal x. So this is critical and important. So in this sense, both Freud and Kant, for very, very different reasons and proposing very, very different arguments, agree. Now at this point, this would be intrapsychic loneliness. It would be the loneliness of the little girl. She identifies with objects. She sees people as objects instead of human beings. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, adoptive parents had to um, put a lock, a chain and a lock on the refrigerator because she wouldn't stop eating once she got a hold of food. She had to be controlled. So this is a case where this child, instead of uh, relating to human beings, never having been nurtured, and, and, and later on it was too late to nurture her, or it was ineffective despite all efforts, actually related to objects than, uh, than people. This would be, as I say, some form of stunted uh, subject-object relation, but it would be intrapsychic. Now for Freud, of course, uh, loneliness uh, and uh, the unconscious and the, the dynamics of consciousness are intrapsychic, basically. It's not until you get to the later Freudians, contemporary Freudians, that it becomes interpersonal. So now we get to the fourth stage, which is that in order to be, no, well, let me read you Freud's uh, statement on the matter. Maybe it'll be easier to see it. I hope it doesn't take too long. This is Freud. Um, and what he's saying is that the child first relates 
to the mother's breast as an inanimate object. Further reflection tells us that the, adult, the adult's ego feeling cannot have been the same from the beginning. It must have gone through a process of development which cannot, of course, be demonstrated, but which admits of being constructed with a fair degree of probability, uh, with a fair degree of probability. An infant at the breast does not as yet distinguish his ego from the external world as the source of the sensations flowing in upon him. He gradually learns to do so in response to various promptings. He must be very strongly impressed. See, he's referring to this, uh, the child as a he instead of a she. I'm sure he'd never get away with it now. He gradually learns to do so in response to various promptings. He must be very strongly impressed by the fact that, this, that some sources of excitation, which he will later recognize as his own bodily organs, can provide him with the sensations at any moment, whereas other sources evade him from time to time. Among them, what he desires most of all, his mother's breast, and only reappear as a result of his screaming for help screaming for help. In this way, there is for the first time set over against the ego an object in the form of something which exists outside and beyond him, which it, and which is uh, forced to, and which is only forced to appear by special action. In other words, uh, in the crib, the baby will, will see the moon and reach for it as if it were part of him. But as time goes on, of course, he realizes that there's an external world. Uh, now, for uh, Kant, this would be this relationship would be called a synthetic a priori relationship. I left some uh, I left some uh, papers at the back. I guess they are. They define the synthetic a priori in Kant. It's used by, uh, of all things, it's uh, first used by Plato in a dialogue called the Mino, which describes the relation uh, between color and extension as comparable to the relation between virtue as knowledge of the good. But beyond Plato, it's, it's also the synthetic a priori appears in Kant, in Hegel, in uh, Husserl, and uh, in, in uh, Sartre. So it's, but it's, it's, it needs some explanation, and if you're interested, maybe it can be passed around or something. All right, so uh, the third uh, source of separation, i.e. loneliness, occurs uh, when the uh, child recognizes that it has to assert itself in some fashion or way. In a very famous passage in the Phenomenology of Spirit of Hegel, uh, it's called the master-slave relation or dialectic uh, or the lordship and bondage uh, dialectic. Uh, it's a fight to the death for recognition. The individual, whether it's a child, a male, or, or a class, as in Marx, uh, fights for uh, dominance, fights uh, to uh, posit itself and its desires over and above the desires of the other. Uh, maybe this would correspond to Freud's toilet training stage where the child doesn't want to and the mother insists that he does. But anyway, this uh, conflict last throughout life. I mentioned the other day, yesterday, actually, uh, your Thomas Hobbes, your Englishman, uh, describes life as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and, uh, but, and that it's a war of all against all. Well, for Freud and for uh, Hobbes and for Sartre, this characterizes uh, the situation. It's an interpersonal conflict as opposed to intrapsychic. Let me see. Nietzsche's will to power is another example of it. But the important point is that instead of relating to an inanimate object, now the relationship is to a living entity being that, of course, will uh, resist and, and, uh, and try to impose its own will. There's a, a wonderful passage in, uh, in uh, uh, Sartre's Being and Nothingness called The Look. Uh, a man is uh, looking through a keyhole and looking at, obviously, something lascivious in the next room, and then suddenly he feels a pair of eyes on him, and he's been turned into an object. He's lost his freedom. He's suddenly become a voyeur, the sort of person that sneaks around and looks through keyholes. Fourth, there is the inevitable anticipation of a final separation from humanity by death. Uh, the world will go on without us, and... Uh, 
will be uh, forgotten in uh, a certain length of time and so on and for so forth. The Greeks believed that you were immortal as long as your friends uh, remembered you. And of course, the Platonic dialogues mean that Plato's immortal, but the rest of us probably won't uh, uh, suffer that fate or that uh, whatever. Uh, for Freud, death signals the natural cycle of separation and the return of the organic to the inorganic. Freud actually believes that this is uh, something that is beneficial. Uh, nevertheless, Freud's uh, principle of uh, thanato thanatology, uh, the god of death, uh, also gets, uh, leads him to uh, describe how violent and uh, self-destructive human beings are. The opposite of uh, thanatos in Freudian psychology is, of course, eros. It's a principle of unification, of, uh, of uh, putting things together, whereas thanatos is a principle of uh, separation and death. This is Freud, by the way. The fear of death in melancholia, which is loneliness, only admits of one explanation. The ego sees itself deserted by all protective forces and lets itself die. Here, moreover, it is once again the same situation as that which first underlay the great anxiety state of birth and the infantile anxiety state of longing, i.e. loneliness, due to separation from the protective mother. So again, it's, it seems to be a dynamic that le leads from, uh, from the cradle to the grave. Uh, let me see. Oh, fifth uh, is psychosis. Psychosis is an internal, internalization of the conflicts that you have with the external world uh, and with other selves, and so you internalize it so that you can deal with it better. Um, in the clinics that I work in, all psychotic states, of course, were treated by medication. Not sure that's the most beneficial for one uh, suffering from psychosis, but anyway. Now, the, again, the existentialists uh, make this as a common theme, Heidegger, Sartre, Camus, and uh, so forth. Um, so. Uh, Hegel has an interesting comment because he claims, Hegel does, that first we must learn, and this is in the philosophy of mind, First, we must learn to understand madness before we can comprehend sanity. This is from Hegel. Man alone has the capacity of grasping himself in this complete abstraction or separation of the eye. This is why he has, again, it's man, not uh, women, so to speak, the privilege of folly and madness. Uh, the conclusion for this, for me at least, is that these, pe these painful separations that we, that it is these painful separations that we need to address and circumvent insofar as we can understand, uh, so far in order that we can understand intimacy. So first we have to go through these uh, different uh, levels of uh, separation and loneliness before we can get to intimacy. Now, most current researchers, materialists, empiricists, behaviorists, and neo-scientists, neuroscientists, contend that loneliness is externally caused by environmental, cultural, and situational conditions and even chemical imbalances in the brain, and therefore temporary, transient, and avoidable. Indeed, the American Psychiatric Association christened the 1990s as the decade of the brain, uh, and if you look at the diagrams or that uh, handout that's uh, at the back of the room, uh, you'll see a, a diagram of how neurons and synapses are miraculously turned into meanings and uh, relations. By contrast, I, I wish to argue that loneliness is internally constituted, not externally caused, within consciousness by the innate activities and structures of conscience, self-consciousness, and Husserlian intentionality, and therefore it is universal, necessary, a priori, permanent, and unavoidable. The solitary self emotionally seeks a mutual affective and cognitive unification or attachment with another self-conscious being through intimacy. The self intrinsically desires to overcome its sense of solipsistic separation, isolation, alienation, and estrangement. These are all synonyms for loneliness. When this fails, feelings Thoughts and fantasies of hostility, anxiety, and even murder and suicide inevitably follow in varying degrees of intensity. So the loneliness and the, the uh, negative effects are in all of us. 
the, the problem is with, when it's extreme, then it turns into violence and, and murder and suicide. Thus the question becomes how to bridge the chasm between loneliness and intimacy, how to transcend the separation between the insularity and attachment, how to establish a conduit between the negative and the positive pol poles outlined above. One of the most important and ageless questions in the history of philosophy and ideas revolves around the single issue, quote, whether senseless matter can think. It is grounded in what Plato calls the battle of the giants, of the gods against the giants, between the idealists and rationalists against the materialists and behaviorists. It pits Plato against Democritus, Plotinus against Epicurus, Augustine and Aquinas against skeptics and atheists, Ficino against Zavala, Descartes, they're Renaissance philosophers, uh, Descartes against Hobbes, Leibniz against Locke, Kant against Hume, Hegel against Marx, Bradley against Mill, Freud against Pavlov, and Husserl and Sartre against Russell and Ryle. In order to understand the effect affective and cognitive roots of loneliness, we must first define the cluster of opposing principles between the two warring camps just cited, which consists of theories of reality and paradigms of consciousness. The first group represents materialism, mechanism, behaviorism, empiricism, and the neurosciences. By contrast, the second group includes dualism, idealism, rationalism, phenomena phenomenology, and existentialism, and it represents a humanistic approach. In what follows, I intend to compare and contrast these two groups uh, against each other. And the question, of course, is which group addresses the reality of loneliness, the reality of loneliness better? Um, now, materialism, very roughly defined, and if you wish, I can define it further, more explicitly. But basically, materialism reduces everything, all of nature, including the brain, to matter plus motion. The matter plus motion. It requires both. Thomas Hobbes uh, is a perfect example of this, uh, this uh, attitude or this uh, thesis or principle. Uh, Mechanism is related to that. Mecha mechanism analogizes, in our context, the brain as a computer, and it's programmed from without. Uh, it, it's, it, I want to claim that loneliness is innate. This is claiming, of course, that the sensory inputs uh, are external to the brain and therefore control it. Uh, human behavior then results to be basically a stimulus response mechanism. Empiricism is the thesis that all, that, uh, that all our ideas, that all that exists in the mind is due to precedent sensations, uh, sensations that come from the outside, or there is nothing in the mind which isn't first uh, uh, presented uh, through experience or sensation. Locke and Hume uh, are two uh, classic examples of that. The brain is like a, a blank tablet, a tabula rasa, uh, Locke tells us, upon which experience writes. It uh, follows, usually, that it, this, these doctrines promote physical and psychological determinism. There is no freedom in these uh, models. Phenomenalism, Hume is a good example, claims that all reality, including the external world, causality, and the self, are merely constructions of sense data. The sense data are caused actually by matter, but your ideas as mental perceptions actually are uh, caused by something physical, but these appearances and their appearances uh, are actually don't reflect the actual atoms. Uh, I mean, so there's a separation between matter and the perceptions in the mind. There is no such thing for knowledge, uh, empirical knowledge for Hume. It's rather the imagination that produces beliefs in the external world, beliefs in causality as an anticipation of, uh, um, a psychological anticipation, a feeling that one thing will follow another. And there is no real self for Hume. For me, I have to argue that there is a real self, otherwise loneliness wouldn't make any sense. So I'm gonna have to deal with that in a moment. In any case, the direction of the uh, uh, consciousness is coming from the outside. It's like an arrow that hits the brain and then appearances or sensations are, 
or impressions, to use uh, Hume's word, uh, are, are caused. Therapy then, can, and treatment then, consists in verbal uh, written contracts, operant conditioning, regimens of psychiatric medication, and evidence-based practices. This is the sort of thing that I, I wish to, to uh, reduce, not eliminate, but uh, reduce, because I, I think they're counterproductive. Uh, the Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders follows this sort of imp empiricist principle of distinguishing uh, things atomistically and then putting them together again. If you look at the uh, DSM, you'll notice that uh, symptoms are repeated for various, for various uh, diagnoses. The diagnoses are supposedly separate and scientific. They're particularized. They're uh, separated from each other and so on, uh, this sort of thing. I, I think that isn't the way human beings are. I, I think consciousness is fluid. It's a, a stream of consciousness, to use William James's phrase. It's, it's uh, dynamic. It's dialectical. Uh, it's, it's rich. It's complex. I don't think you can reduce uh, human beings and the mind and the soul, the Greek psyche or the Christian soul or the Cartesian cogito or the self to, to this sort of uh, model. Or, uh, anyway, uh, the people that I'm uh, uh, arguing with are neuroscientists, uh, researchers like John Cacioppo at the University of Chicago, my old alma mater, Paul and Patricia Churchland, uh, who uh, practice at, uh, who are in the philosophy department at the University of California at San Diego, where I graduated uh, from. Uh, and they reduce consciousness to electrochemical impulses in the brain. Uh, for example, uh, imagine that I'm actually in another room all by myself presenting this lecture to you. But on the screen here, what you see is the electroencephalograph showing these jagged edges and things like that. Would that be a meaningful thing? I would propose to you it, it wouldn't. You couldn't capture what I was trying to say. Now it is one thing to say that we cannot think without a brain, but quite a different matter to claim that the, that the mind is com completely reducible to, identical with, or explainable by brain motions. An electroencephalograph may indicate that the brain is thinking, but it cannot tell us what it is thinking. Meanings are not identical to sensations, to a random collection of impression, human impressions or Lockean sensations. It, it, and, 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 those, and sensations are just that and nothing more. But a meaning is something above and beyond any set of sensations. The conclusion follows that together these combined theories, materialism, behaviorism, empiricism, are unable to provide any mean, meaningful conception for one, a substantial self, two, the activity of reflexive self-consciousness, and three, the active intentionality of, of uh, consciousness. Now, all idealists and all rationalists believe that the mind is reflexive, that, that the mind can think its own thoughts. This goes back to Plato's uh, Theotetus and the Sophists. He says that the uh, thinking is the soul's internal dialogue with itself. It also goes back to, um, to Aristotle's principle of the unmoved mover who actively only thinks about himself. Now what I'm going to argue, hopefully get to it, is that the, the mind has two active features. One is self-consciousness, which is reflexive, unified, circular, and the other one is intentionality, which the self goes beyond its own thoughts to posit meanings, relations, uh, whatever you want, beyond itself. This is Husserl, this is Sartre, this is Franz Brentano, uh, a Catholic priest who was the, uh, the uh, teacher of uh, Husserl, and so on and so forth. Uh, now the self, in, if you were to try to make sense of the self in materialist uh, in, in, material, in a materialist context, the best you could come up with is that it's the person's DNA, the, the molecular structure of his DNA. But DNA seems like a, a kind of a, a vapid concept uh, for a self. Uh, yeah. The other problem with the materialist, behaviorist, uh, empiricist, 
theory is there is no self. Hume argues in the treatise of human nature, 1739-40, in a very, very famous uh, passage that when I look into myself, in quotes, all I see are fleeting impressions, Hume's a word for sensations, uh, which follow each other with inconceivable rapidity. Every time I change my glance, there's a, a different self. So strictly speaking, there is no self. It's a fiction, it's a natural fiction. We all have it and it's good enough to operate in the world with, but it's nothing metaphysical. There's no real substantial self. Uh, and I want to argue there is a self. It's in this world. I don't know about the other world, where it's, whether it's transported or not to the other world, but it's certainly in this world, I would say. Uh, Auguste Comte makes a telling uh, criticism. He says, uh, there can, he, father of sociology, says there actually can't be anything like self-consciousness because it would mean that the instrument of observation and the object of observation would be the same, and that's impossible. It's like trying to make a hammer with a hammer. I mean, you need something beyond and above uh, the hammer if you're going to make it. So the conclusion is that the concept of passive perception versus the, the concept of passive uh, perceptions versus active self-consciousness and tran transcendent intentionality are radically opposed. So in the context of loneliness, it, it's going to, it seems to me, much harder to prove and uh, the meaning of loneliness, the feeling of loneliness, if you're going to stick with a behaviorist, materialist model. By contrast, uh, idealism and dualism both uh, claim that the mind is active, that our thoughts are active. For a dualist, of course, uh, someone like Descartes, the, uh, the mind, uh, through the cogito, I think therefore I am, knows that it is active, but the world, uh, the physical external world, is something that we must infer. Uh, we don't know it directly, we only know ourselves. But insofar as we do infer it, we regard the external world as inert. It doesn't do anything, it just lies there. It's only the mind that can do things. Uh, so, rationalism is the uh, thesis that there are some ideas uh, that are independent of experience, that we know them innately. Uh, cause and effect would be one of the classic examples that rationalism uses. But rationalism is deeper than that. It argues that the mind is spontaneous. It actively creates itself. It's able to create relations and meanings. More than that, there's a complexity that comes out, and it, it comes out of all things in a philosopher called Plotinus, a Neoplatonist. According to Plotinus, the mind, the soul, has to continually think, because if it didn't think, uh, then it would disappear. It wouldn't be the same mind when it awoke or whatever. Uh, this doctrine of the unconscious is already in, uh, in uh, Plotinus. If you read the monumental work of uh, Ellenberger, the, the unconscious, he, he barely mentions Plotinus. I'm not even sure he mentions him. The next philosopher who worries about the unconscious is the British uh, Platonist, Ralph Cudworth, the English uh, Platonist, the Cambridge Platonist. Uh, and then the next one is Leibniz. So what they're saying is that the mind must continually think. It's immaterial, therefore immortal. Not only is it immaterial uh, and immortal, but it has a unity of consciousness because it has no parts. It, it unifies itself in consciousness and it has continuity because you can't break up something that has no parts. You can't disunify it. It has to be immortal, and it has to stay as a, as a continuity. So the self is a continuity, okay? Now, what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And therapy, as opposed to a behavioral, cog behavioral cognitive therapy, is based on insight. Uh, I think Freud, uh, Freud's therapy is also based on insight and certainly uh, existential. 
therapy as uh, proposed by Irving Yalom is also based on insight. So the conclusion is there is, uh, in the empiricist conclusion is, there is no self. The self is just a loose, disunified bundle of separate sensations which follow each other with inconceivable rapidity. Okay, then that's important. What, uh, what uh, Hume says in the treatise is, when I look into myself, and so far I can, I don't see myself, I see perceptions of either impressions or ideas, but they're not the self. But these impressions follow each other, succeed each other with inconceivable rapidity. So if you look at um, philosophy, you've got three options in terms of consciousness. Where, where do you start? Well, you can start with the external world, uh, that the external world of matter exists, and we're part of uh, the external world, like the Stoics and the Epicureans uh, held, and, uh, and uh, uh, Leucippus and Democritus held, and so on and so forth. The problem with that approach is the external world is doubtful. The skeptic Montaigne doubted it, uh, the rationalist uh, Descartes doubted it, uh, Hume doubts it, and so on and so forth. So uh, that, that won't work. Uh, so, but if the soul always thinks, then presumably at some level you're always conscious in, in some fashion or another. There's a continuity of consciousness. Now when you get to Locke and you get to Hume, they claim that when you're asleep or in a, a, a deep swoon or something, the soul stops thinking. You couldn't have continuous personal identity then. It would mean that every time you woke up, you'd be a different person. If that were the case, of course, a moral responsibility w would, would be out the door. You'd simply say, oh, that wasn't me. That was me on September 15th, but now it's, I'm a different self, okay? What, what happens now is that there's a distinction in German idealism. The, the idealists uh, that are leading up to this are, are uh, Leibniz, who also believes in the unconscious. Uh, but what happens next is Kant is faced with the problem, how do human beings think? How is self-consciousness possible? How does it even come about? Okay? And Kant distinguishes between what's called the productive imagination and the reproductive imagination. The reproductive imagination is our usual consciousness. Uh, we we uh, connect, we associate birds with wings, we connect, we associate sugar with sweetness, that sort of thing. But there's a deeper productive, actually subconscious, that is below the unconscious for Kant. It is creative. The productive uh, consciousness creates the categories of thought, uh, the 12 categories in Kant of subject and object, uh, self and object, of cause and effect, and so on and so forth. And these categories are created by thought itself. They don't come from the outside like the empiricists claim, but rather they're pure synthetic a priori categories that categorize structure, order, the incoming material that's coming from whatever the world is beyond these uh, structures, and it puts it together. So not only is there an unconscious, but suddenly there's this very creative un un subconscious. Uh, it's a little bit like when we think of God creating the world and each individual soul out of nothing, ex nihilo. Kant mentions the word spontaneity no less than 12 times in the Critique of Pure Reason. After Kant has tried to explain, or has explained in the subjective idealist terms, um, how we connect our, our experiences, our human experiences, um, Fichte, following Kant, does something uh, very different. What Kant is worried about is how we know. He has a cognitive uh, agenda. Fichte, by contrast, has an active agenda. He wants to know why we act. And he claims, Fichte does, that we act spontaneously in a way that's absolutely unpredictable. It's the will. It's, it's a, a, a form of voluntarism. 
It's an irrational will. He's not worried about how we know. He's worried about how we act. He's going to end up and say that we act morally, but, uh, but the, the, the bottom line is that our actions are affective. They're, they're, they're part of the will, not part of knowledge. I'm going to read you a passage uh, from uh, Lawrence White's The Unconscious Before Freud. Uh, it is this subconscious neglected synthetic activity of the mind which constructs a unity from separate contrasts and thus preserves a unity linking both ego and non-ego. It is this alone which makes possible consciousness and above all as a continuous temporal sequence. <clears throat> In other words, both the unity of consciousness and time consciousness are made possible by the by the productive imagination and its a priori synthetic activities. Fichte opens up a sequence of philosophers, Schelling, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche, who developed the, con the conception of the subconscious mind as a dynamic principle underlying conscious uh, reason. For Fichte, the light of consciousness emerges out of the dark of the subconscious. The Freudian conscious, unconscious processes of the mind had previously been considered by philosophers, that would be Plotinus, uh, Cudworth, and, and Leibniz, to be mainly concerned with memory and perception. Now they became unmistakably the seat of instinct and will. The apperceptive self-conscious faculty, the conscient, uh, faculty of self-consciousness, the apperceptive, apperceptive self-conscious faculty of the mind is an activity which contains the ultimate basis for consciousness but never itself comes to consciousness. So deep down there's something uh, very uh, sinister for, for Fichte. Uh, it's a dark unconscious. For Plotinus it's evil, it's, it's uh, matter. Uh, Plotinus has an emanation theory where you go from top to bottom. The top would be the good, the bottom would be evil, sensation, and matter and things like that, feelings and that sort of thing. So just, just as in Freud's, no, just as in Freud's unconscious id, which ultimately grounds the continuous, per, grounds continuous personal identity of the self, just so these dark forces of the subconscious constitute the ultimate nucleus of selfhood, the narcissistic self, and it is an identity which is impermeable to rational penetration. Again, within the German idealist tradition, there are subterranean powers that are subconsciously generative, not only in regard to cognitive consciousness, as in Kant's concept of the categories of the understanding, the synthetic uh, a priori 12 categories, but also in producing dark and dangerous emotions whose ultimate sources are in principle inaccessible, deeply hidden, and subterranean. Now, if this is true, then uh, therapy in the Freudian sense isn't going to work because there's something underneath that's e even darker than your, than your memory that you were molested by your father and that sort of thing. These affective, emotional, uncontrollable, irrational instincts. And think of Nietzsche's will to power or uh, Schopenhauer's uh, will, the, the noumenal will in, in Schopenhauer. Urges and destructive forces can only be indirectly suggested in literature, as in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Gide's The Immoralist, Golding's Pincher Martin and Lord of the Flies, Hess's Steppenwolf, Kaczynski's The Painted Bird, and Jung's uh, concept of the shadow self. Their original literary expressions uh, first appear in Egyptian and Greek mythology as they are secretly and insidiously <coughs> as they secretly and insidiously persevere, emerge and erupt during our dreams and nightmares. Uh, there's a couple of books now by a guy named John Mills that I've uh, corresponded with. Um, one of the books is called, uh, John is spelled J-O-N by the way, Mills. Uh, the Unconscious Abyss, Hegel's Anticipation of uh, Freudian uh, Psychoanalysis and uh, Underworlds, Philosophies of the unconscious from metaphysics to, uh, to a psychoanalysis. Uh, Mills turns to the early Egyptian myths uh, that are very dark uh, and uh, foreboding and uh, terrifying. Freud, as you know, of course, uh, often turns to the Greek myths. But both of them have uh, strong elements of uh, 
of uh, terror and uh, sadness and loneliness and things like that. Anyway. Now, the first article ever written that I'm aware of on loneliness as a subject matter in its own right is by Gregory Zilborg. Uh, it's published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1938. Uh, what Zilborg does is he uh, centers loneliness on narcissism. I would say that all human beings are narcissistic. Uh, some more than others, some more dangerously than others, but I would, I would argue that every human being is narcissistic. It's a Greek myth too, of course. Now, according to uh, Zilborg, what happens is at first when the infant is born, it's nurtured, it's pampered, it's adored, it's uh, taken care of, it's talked to, it's uh, I, I just, anyway, it, the result of that is that it be, the infant, the narcissistic infant, becomes uh, used to being, uh, being important, uh, being uh, appreciated or whatever. Then it finds out that it has a world to deal with, other people to deal with, and then it becomes hostile. So the synthetic a priori relation in Zilborg is that you move from narcissism when after the oceanic feeling, after uh, you realize the separation of the one uh, of the self from uh, objects and that sort of thing, you enter into this interpersonal stage where you have experienced conflicts with other selves in the world and that sort of thing. And this produces hostility. So that there's an intrinsic innate relationship between narcissism, loneliness, and hostility. Uh, and he says it often develops into murder first and suicide. Uh, you, you, I'll get to it in a minute. So, uh, and Zilborg is writing in 1938, he's Jewish, um, he's from one of the R Russias, uh, but anyway, he's in New York, he's escaped, but he already realizes that you can apply this to nations, that the Germans after World War I felt uh, that they were humiliated, that they were punished, uh, that they were ostracized from the global community and so on and so forth. So he argues that no, his Nazism starts roughly around 1933. So he, he already realizes that the Germans are on a very destructive road. Uh, Hannah Arendt in 1948 in The Origins of Totalitarianism argues the same thing, that it's loneliness that causes people to do exactly what ISIS is doing now. They feel they've been left out. They want to destroy the past. The, 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 I don't know, the trophies at Palmyra and all those sorts of things. Okay. Now, what Zilborg says, he, he describes how the infant's narcissistic ego, initially pampered, loved, and admired, experiences feelings of omnipotence, delusions of grandeur, entitlement issues, which he calls megalomania, this feeling of omnipotence. But as the self develops and its impetuous desires are thwarted by the mother and society, the ego becomes angry and anxious. It experiences a sense of separation and intense feelings of loneliness. As the child grows into adolescence and adulthood, if this state of tension becomes unduly prolonged or intensified, it can lead to suicide, murder, or both. Uh, or, or, or both. Uh, okay. Now, th there is a case I, I, I would like to refer you to, that it's, it's on Google. Uh, I, I was asking yesterday if you uh, are aware of what goes on in the United States when these young people who have access to guns, not only young people, but I mean full-blown adults, when they have access to guns um, and they're invariably uh, described as loners, uh, they go on a, a rampage. They've made up their mind they're going to kill themselves, but uh, they're going to take other people down with them. Uh, the, the Lufthansa pilot, uh, Andreas uh, uh, Lubitz, I, I think ha had that kind of impulse in mind, that kind of volitional will, not only to kill himself, but to kill 
many others. But the, uh, the Google uh, article I wish to refer you to is autobiographical. It's by the kid uh, in Santa Barbara. It happened last year uh, in Santa Barbara. He was offended that uh, good-looking blondes didn't pay any attention to him. His name's Elliot Roger, and if you look on Google, uh, he writes his biography starting from the day of his birth all the way till the day, uh, the day that he uh, committed uh, six murders of young people in retaliation. Uh, so I say mo most instructive is the case of Elliot Rogers who tried to penetrate a sorority house in order to murder all its residents because he felt rejected by young women in general for not sufficiently appreciating him. His 140-page single-spaced autobiography is replete with narcissistic fantasies of revenge, hatred, envy, delusions of grandeur, entitlement issues, and so on. He experienced powerful feelings of narcissism which fueled entitlement issues he, uh, entitlement issues. He simply could not understand why one young women were not enamored of him. He was furious that he was still a virgin. He endlessly play, played video games in order to discharge his feelings of rage and envy when he observed happy couples. He wanted to kill his younger brother because he feared his sibling might achieve a happy life while he felt denied and lonely. If I can't enjoy this world, I'm not going to let others enjoy it either. He expected, he actually counted on winning the lottery so he could dominate women with his wealth. Failing to breach the sorority residence, he managed to kill six students before committing suicide. Uh, the Google article would be dated 5-23-2014, so a little over a year ago. So for a compelling study of loneliness and all its implications, I, I would urge you to see what uh, lonely anger can produce. Now, as I say, Zilbor recognizes that loneliness can produce this sort of destruction, not only in individuals, but in groups. Uh, one of the big problems now, of course, is the bullying that goes on in American and, uh, I don't know, English schools, but certainly in our schools. Uh, and, uh, and then the Columbine, uh, uh, two teenage uh, students uh, killed 20 people, injured 34 when they they express their anger. Uh, anyway. Let me jump now to the second article that is dedicated to loneliness in its own right. It's by the uh, psychologist, again a psychoanalyst, uh, Frieda from Reichman. Uh, it was posthumously published, but uh, she writes it in 1959, and it appeared in the journal Psychiatry. Uh, same journal that uh, in 1977 uh, my uh, article on loneliness appeared because I was copying her, emulating her. Uh, in her article, from Reichman makes two points. Uh, she's trying to win over a psychotic patient uh, and connect with her, communicate with her, and she's getting nowhere until she suddenly says, that lonely, ask the question, and suddenly the gates of communication open up. But uh, her main point is that uh, loneliness produces anxiety. And, uh, and indeed, she identifies loneliness as anxiety. So at this point, we have loneliness including hostility, aggression, and anxiety, uh, and probably failed, uh, a sense of failed communication. So those three dynamics are included within loneliness. Her uh, ex-husband, Eric Fromm, in The Art of uh, Loving, includes not only anxiety, but he also includes uh, guilt and shame. When you're lonely, you, you, you feel shame. You feel that uh, people will see you as a pathetic creature, as someone that's weak. That's why people don't want to talk about loneliness. They do not want to admit that they're lonely. That isn't something that comes easily to them. They can admit to depression, they can admit to anxiety, but they won't admit to loneliness. Now, of course, this, this is starting to change, but nevertheless, that's why I say that uh, loneliness is an umbrella concept. It includes all sorts of feelings of, of uh, abandonment, of betrayal, of resentment, of anger, of hatred, so on and so forth. 
You could do the same, of course, with, uh, although I don't, you could do the same with, um, what did I say, uh, the opposite of loneliness is, what did I say it was? I forgot. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. intimacy, thank you, thank you. Somebody's listening out there, that, that's, that's uh, satisfying. Yeah, you could do it uh, with intimacy as well. It would include a bunch of kind of, so that would mean that human beings as dynamic, uh, self-conscious, intentional creatures. By the way, another word for intentionality is purposiveness. It's opposed to mechanism, okay? Uh, you could say that we gravitate between those two poles of intimacy and, uh, and loneliness. In any case, loneliness is not a disease. It's not uh, a uh, disorder. It's the human, the existential human condition. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that happens is, i go back to Hume and Kant, Recall that uh, what uh, Hume is saying is that if you look into the self, all you see is these perceptions, not self-conscious, these perceptions of sensations, impressions, and ideas that succeed each other with inconceivable rapidity. Okay. Now, what Kant does is he picks up on the on the concept of succession or temporal consciousness. And in the critique of pure reason, in the arguments of the deductions, the two deductions, 1781 in A deduction and 1787 in the B deduction, he argues that you can deny the existence of the external world, we've already seen that. You can deny the existence of the self, Hume's doing that. But you cannot deny that you're aware of time consciousness. Now, this concept of internal time consciousness, imminent time consciousness, is radically opposed to the Aristotelian, Newtonian concept of time, that time is the measure of motion in space, of bodies moving in space. This is an internal time consciousness. This is why uh, uh, people like Heidegger uh, talk about being and time. This is why Sartre pays so much attention to time. This is why Husserl writes the phenomenology of internal time consciousness. If you're aware of time internally, and your time is going to be different when you're in a dentist's office than the dentist's uh, time. He's trying to just get through the day. You're trying to get through misery. And, and so this is a, a personal time. If you think of the stream of consciousness styles of writing in James Joyce and in, in, in Faulkner and in, in, uh, in uh, Wolf and Thomas Wolf and so on, you, you realize that individual imminent human time is very different. But if you can be aware, conscious of time, it means you've been able to connect, to unify past, present, and future together. You could only do that if you're the same self, soul, psyche, or whatever you want to call it. So that's one strong argument for the subjectivity of consciousness and therefore indirectly loneliness. The second argument that uh, Kant uses is in the 1787 uh, uh, deduction, transcendental deduction, which is his proof that the categories actually work and, uh, and uh, condition human experience, ordinary experience, and natural science. He's trying to buttress up uh, Newtonian science. The second argument is given in B131. He claims that there is a unity of self-consciousness because we synthesize, we bind, we, we relate uh, our ideas to each other in a unified whole. That is why I know my ideas are mine and not yours, and you know yours are yours and not mine, which means it separates us on both counts. In other words, both imminent time consciousness, I experience uh, my, uh, ex my temporal experiences differently than you do. Uh, Ruth's experiences of our trip to England are going to be very different than mine uh, in a temporal structural fashion. And my consciousness is different than hers uh, because I know what I'm feeling and thinking, and she knows what she's feeling. Sometimes we can connect those, but essentially human beings are solipsistic. This is the theme of subjective idealism, 
uh, it, it starts, uh, certainly gets full blown in Descartes, uh, goes on into Leibniz's mon monadic theory, and in Kant's subjective idealism. Not so much so in, in Hegel. Hegel, that's the reason I don't usually emphasize Hegel, because he's more interpersonal. For Hegel, the self is conditioned by other selves. In order to be self-conscious, you have to, oh. Being okay, all right, okay, I got you, sorry. So, okay, let me go to the uh, solution of uh, loneliness. And it's based in empathy. Empathy is a theory, a conception, by Theodore Lips, uh, who claims it's an aesthetic experience. When we enjoy an aesthetic object, whether it's a painting or a dancer or a, or a sculpture or whatever it is, we project our feelings into the object so that uh, it's really ourselves, our expression of freedom and of beauty that we put into the object. Uh, and when Husserl picks up on his problem, uh, how do I know there are other selves? How do I climb out of this state of uh, solipsism? Uh, how, how do I know that I'm working with other scientists? He claims that it's a cognitive uh, thing. In other words, I apresentationally or I analogically place my self and body in the place of the other. But in doing so, he's still stuck. He's separated it because it's not an immediate feeling of empathy. It's rather that I've projected what would it be like if I were the other self standing over there whereas I'm here, that sort of thing. Now, what my proposal is, is that empathy is actually a feeling thing, a feeling thing. And therefore, there are circumstances under which you have uh, intimacy based on empathy. It doesn't happen often. It's sort of like a peak experience of Maslow. But it's, uh, you, you know it, for example, when uh, a young couple experiences the death of their child and, and they know exactly what each of them are, are feeling. Or when a loving couple finds out that one of them has terminal cancer, then they, they actually know how each uh, of the other is feeling. So that feeds into intimacy. So again, loneliness is the negative pole. Intimacy would be the positive uh, pole. Um, in terms of getting out of uh, yourself, so to speak, uh, intentionality does it. What uh, loneliness, what self-consciousness does is it entraps you in a state of depression that you lose your vitality, your energy, and things like that. It's very enervating. That's the bad part of self-consciousness. You brood on it. You, you isolate yourself. But the good part is the insight part. But even that the good part isn't enough. So you turn to intentionality, which is a, a, an active force in consciousness, just as self-consciousness is. But it projects you to uh, create values for yourself, to create meanings for yourself. That's what intentionality is. It's a, a way to uh, intentionally create meanings and feelings beyond transcendent to yourself. And then you can bring them back within yourself and then do them again. It's what Sartre calls uh, projects, uh, that sort of thing. You get to be busy in, in things that you wish to do and so on and so forth. Anyway, in, to a certain extent, I hope I've uh, made a case, I don't know how strong, for uh, um, that all human beings are lonely, why they are lonely, uh, the consequences of loneliness, and also the, uh, uh, the possible remedies for it. Thank you.